I'm uh, very happy to host Christian Schafmeister to give his talk that I witnessed on the European LISP uh, Symposium in April in London. And um, I think you are in for a real treat. Uh, Christian Schafmeister. All right, thank you very much. And thank you, Martin, for inviting me. This is really, really a treat to come up and be able to uh, present uh, what, we've been, what I've been working on for the last, um, well, my life, really. Uh, OK, so um, what, um, so uh, I'll tell you a little bit of my background. So I've been programming since I was 12. I was one of the kids in Radio Shack programming on TRS-80. And that's in my blood. Some people read to relax. Some people knit to relax. I write code to relax. But I'm also, uh, now I'm a chemistry professor at Temple University, and I build molecules as well. Because what I want to do is I want to build molecules as easily as I can write software. I want to build molecules that can do things like act like machines and go into the body and fix things. Uh, basically, I'm inspired by um, Richard Feynman. Uh, I gave this talk in 1959 called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, where he, for the first time sort of proposed the idea of building machines on a molecular scale that are atomically precise, where you know where every atom is in space. And um, that idea is what has propelled me into the field that I've gone into. Um, and basically, um, my background, I've done uh, biophysics, where I was making proteins and solving crystal structures of proteins. Then I got into chemistry, and I'll show you what we've done in chemistry uh, in that time. So basically, we understand a lot about how molecular machinery works. The mo molecular machinery that makes us work are called proteins. They are chains of amino acids that fold into these three-dimensional structures. Let me get this pointer up. Here we are. So they fold into these three-dimensional structures, and they arrange atoms and groups in precise three-dimensional constellations so that they can do things like this one here speeds up a chemical reaction. This one's actually being developed by the uh, Department of Defense to hydrolyze nerve agents, to detoxify nerve agents. This is a molecule called an antibody. It's a huge molecule that has these two binding sites up here and up here. They're pockets that can recognize surfaces of other proteins, like viruses and, and, and proteins that don't belong in our bodies, and, and start the, the process of where the immune system will attack them. And then we have things down here like channels. These are aquaporins. These are molecules that let water pass through a membrane, but don't let anything else pass through. And they keep our cells from bursting. So they maintain the osmotic pressure across cells. Now, if we could build things like this, we could solve most of humanity's problems. I mean, if we could make catalysts that could pull carbon dioxide and water out of the air and knit them together using sunlight, we could make fuels that way. We could solve most of our problems. And the solutions to most of our problems are down there at the molecular scale. We just have to figure out how to make molecules like the ones that I showed you. Now, um, I know a little bit about this because as a graduate student, I built one of the first unnatural proteins. It's called DHP1. This is the crystal structure. I, I, I designed it uh, on paper, really. I designed a gene that expressed the protein. I put it into bacteria. I expressed the protein, purified it, crystallized it. This is from the crystal structure and showed that it formed this sort of a four helix bundle, which is a very common motif in proteins. It took me four years to put this thing together. It's a molecular boat anchor. It doesn't do anything. And I didn't know how to make other ones. And I got very fed up with proteins uh, because they're very soft, flexible, floppy molecules. Then I looked at synthetic chemistry. I see chemists making all these wonderful natural products, these huge molecules. And I said, I could do that. I could design new building blocks that are easier to uh, design with. And uh, so I did my postdoc actually down the street in the chemistry department at Harvard. And while I was there, I invented these things. This, this is an idea where we stabilize small sections of proteins called peptides in uh, a very common sort of shape that they adopt, which are these helices. And what, what I 
what I did was I synthesized these unnatural amino acids that we could form a crosslink across one or two turns of a helix to stabilize it in that structure. But it's a very sort of subtle stabilization. Yet, it is being developed down the street about five blocks away by this company called Aileron, and uh, it's called, they call it stapled peptides, and um, Roche, uh, several years ago, put $1.2 billion into this to develop these as drugs. So something that I invented uh, is being uh, moved forward and is, is currently in, in clinical trials. As of February, they, they have a molecule in clinical trial for cancer. Okay, but I don't do this anymore. Um, I work with uh, different kinds of molecules. So I'm very inspired by proteins. You take a bunch of proteins and DNA and you hold them at 38 degrees for 35 days and you make these wonderfully functional things like us and eagles and trees and everything. But you take them out of that comfort zone for even a little while, <laughs> right? And they turn into scrambled egg. They're delicious, but they're not very functional. Proteins are very fragile, and they're very difficult to design with. And I know because I've done this. So I came up with something else. I came up with new building blocks that are easier to design with. So these building blocks are sort of, they're synthetic. You have to make them using chemistry. They are rings, and they've got an amino acid on one side, another amino acid on the other side. You can display functional groups. Other groups hang it off of the off of the building block, and they have different shapes. So we have these five-membered rings, we have six-membered rings. We can move where the amino acid is relative to the other one, move it around. And um, there's also a thing in here called stereocenters. So this carbon here can have this, this is a carboxylic acid, can have it projected out towards you like it's shown, or into the screen. These are three-dimensional objects. And basically what these things are is they're like little Lego bricks and they connect to each other through pairs of bonds. So unlike proteins, which are amino acids, they're strung together through single bonds, and they're floppy and flexible, and they have to fold up. That's great for biology because it needs to take them apart again and recycle the components. I want something that's more rigid and more designable. So these building blocks connect through pairs of bonds, and that's quite a trick to get all that to work. So we synthesize these building blocks, and we can now do it hundreds of grams. It's process chemistry. We, can make, we could make kilograms and tons of this stuff. Um, but they're little bricks. They have a functional group that hangs off of them, and they all have different shapes. And when I started out, I didn't really care what the shapes were. As long as they were different and they projected into three-dimensional space, I figured I could just do the geometry and build molecules that adopt any three-dimensional structure I want. And so. Um, we make a lot of these little sticks that have functional groups pointing off in different directions, and we can control the shape by controlling the sequence of building blocks and by controlling what we hang off of the building blocks. All right, so that's the basic technology. That's the instruction set. So what we want to do with this going forward is I want to make all sorts of things. This, this is an idea to make channels that can act as antimicrobial compounds. Basically, they're, they're rings that have a... Um, uh, a water uh, loving uh, sort of a pore that is accessible to water. We put greasy groups on the outside and we, we mix this with bacteria. They would drop into the bacterial membranes, hold open a hole and cause the bacteria to bleed its guts out. Okay, an antimicrobial, general antimicrobial compound. There's a lot of compounds in nature that work sort of like this, but they have to self-assemble. And so you need large concentrations of them. These could be very active. Another thing that you could use pores like this for is to do single sequencing, single molecules of DNA. We are the only people who could make atomically precise pores that you could thread a piece of DNA through to read its sequence. And this is something that we're just getting into. Now these are concepts. These are things that we're, we can do like in the next 10 years. Um, here's another idea. We make these triangular molecules and we stick greasy groups into the middle and they can basically create boxes with different internal shapes that small molecules would go into. So you could make all sorts of sensors for small molecules. And by making arrays of these, you could th create things like artificial nose that would detect all sorts of molecules. Um, a good thing about the molecules that we're working with is that they're very robust. They, they don't get degraded by nature, uh, by proteases. They don't unfold. They're very robust. So they could, last, they could be put on a sensor and last for years. It could be put into cell phones and last for years. Um, this is another concept here of making molecules that could act as channels. So by 
creating bundles of these molecules and making, setting them up just right, designing them properly, you could create molecules that could be pores. And they could do things like separate ions from seawater. We could separate gold from seawater. I wouldn't need to write grant proposals. <laughs> you, you could create molecules that could uh, act as water channels and pack them as close as densely as possible so that you can make membranes that are, work at theoretical limits of efficiency for purification of water. Water is going to become a big problem in the next decades. We could make molecules that act like artificial antibodies that project multiple sort of pre-organized uh, arms out and instead of like pharmaceutical chemistry makes small molecules that bind into greasy pockets on proteins, we could make molecules that wrap around proteins like antibodies do. And I have schemes on how to make a billion of these and then just fish out which ones bind particular proteins. Uh, the big thing though that I want to do is I want to make catalysts, molecules that make other molecules. Because then I could make molecules that make our building blocks and we wouldn't need to keep synthesizing them all the time. And we could start bootstrapping this technology and make it very, very inexpensive. And I think I know how to do this. We've already done and made some catalysts with the little molecules that we're able to make till now. A couple of things that we really have done already is we've assembled uh, this molecule here. This as our building blocks here in the backbone, it presents these three groups, and there are 256 different shapes that this can adopt because of all these stereocenters. They can, this group here can either go into the screen or come out of the screen, so it's, it's one bit of information. And there are eight of these centers that can each be what are called S or R configuration, so there's 256 stereoisomers. About six of them present all of the groups on one side so they can slot into the groove of this protein called MDM2. And this molecule goes into cells, binds this protein, and stabilizes it. You can see when we add the compound, as you add more compound, the levels of the protein go way up. And another molecule that Roche was developing to bind this protein called Nutlin does not do this. So our molecules do things that are different from small molecules. And this just shows that these are sort of confocal images, slices through the cell, and you can see the compound is all throughout the cell. The compound is green because it carries a green fluorescent group. So we published this uh, a couple of years ago, 2012. Here's another molecule we've made. It's a catalyst. This is a molecule that speeds up a chemical reaction. It will take methanol here and vinyl trifluoroacetate, and you add our molecule like one percent. Uh, so one molecule of our catalyst here for every hundred molecules of this, and it will turn over and create this molecule. And this here is a graph of product with time, and you can see when we have uh, the, the optimal version of the catalyst, when, where all of the stereocenters are set up properly, all of these groups have the right arrangement of groups. When we set everything up properly, and there's thousands of permutations here, we just made a few of them that we designed with earlier versions of my software that I'll tell you about. And uh, when you do it, design it optimally, you get the maximal activity. We can measure the rates of the reaction. When you change anything, like you move this nitrogen here to this position here, then the rate drops off. Okay, it's a slower, less efficient catalyst. Uh, right, so, and, so what this thing does is it, the backbone, arranges the groups. This is a pyridine base. This is a benzyl alcohol here. And this is a urea. And it arranges all of the groups so that the substrate, the material that goes in and gets transformed, can interact properly with all, all of these groups. And we set everything up properly, it speeds up a chemical reaction. All right, so we can design molecules that do things. And we can use, with these building blocks, we can use software to design these molecules. And I'll show you how sort of that works. So, uh, but the ultimate goal is to build bigger things, build things the size of cells, where we use this chemistry that I've described to make bundles of these sticks, and we set them up properly so they can self-assemble into larger materials, and those materials would include catalysts, they would include motors, they would include things that can do information processing, and ultimately we might be able to build things like this, like little robots that could be injected into the body, go and find damaged tissue, 
kill things, repair things, fix everything. That's the ultimate goal here. I don't know if I'll reach it in my lifetime. I'm working as hard as I can. OK, so basically, these molecular Lego, we call them spiroligomers. These molecular Lego are an instruction set for making molecules that do things, that bind to things, and that speed up chemical reactions. And we're also working on making pores. Um, the small versions that we've made so far, they're inherently limited because they're small. But when we can start to tie multiple molecules together, uh, tie them together into a big molecules where we can create pockets and we can create large surfaces, then we could start to achieve the things that proteins can do. But there's going to be a lot of design and a lot of development to get there. The design, I basically have a design problem now because I can synthesize molecules that are much larger and much more complex than I can design. Now, synthetic chemists, normally they design things with plastic model sets. I should have brought one. There are these little balls. You've probably seen them. And this kind of a size molecule would be something about the size of a washing machine. All right? And with so many configurable parts to it that it's just impossible to design by hand. We need software. Now, I, so basically, oh, wait, I'm out of, OK. So I had a little animation there. OK, basically what I need is an oracle. I need something where I can go in and specify what the molecule needs to do. And I sort of know what that means. It means where do functional groups need to be in space? For a catalyst, it means arranging them around a what's called a transition state of a reaction. For binding a protein, it means just arranging them in, the, in a way that uh, looks like the groups are arranged from a protein that we've already determined the structure for. Um, but we need something where we can make specify a problem like that and then have it come up with a design for a molecular device based on this molecular Lego. And so to design, to build, I decided to write an oracle and basically went off on a big side project for the last four years. Uh, so the expression here, yak shaving, this is referring to this expression of where you're, you're doing any apparently useless activity which ultimately allows you to solve a larger problem. For the last four years, I've been developing software to design these molecules. And I've done it in a very unusual way, what I think is the best possible way. Really, what I need is a language. I need a language that has a lot of chemistry functionality built into it. Because I don't really know what the problem is that I'm trying to solve. I want to be able to quickly write you know, try something, and then if it works, great. If it doesn't, I want to throw it away, and I want to try and build something else. And the sort of software that's available now to design molecules is really, there's a lot of um, sort of graphical user interfaces where you can draw molecules. They're way too slow for me. It takes like 20 minutes to draw one of these molecules and then do an energy minimization. It's, it's just, you know, working with one molecule at a time like that is completely pointless. What I need is something where I can run, build, and run simulations on a million molecules at a time, on hundreds of thousands of CPUs. So what I need is a, so what I've done is I've written a C++ library that builds molecules and does all the stuff that I need. But I don't want to write this stuff in C++. It is a very difficult language to write in. I also need to use, as you know, I also need to use a lot of libraries that people are writing in C++. And I, again, I don't want to write in C++. I want to write in some sort of higher level scripting language. Um, so where I started is I started first tying this into Python. And so uh, I used Python, and I used this template library called Boost Python in C++. And I had all this stuff working, and I almost went nuts with it. Because you spend all of your time dealing with getting the interface to work, getting the memory models to work, connect together, to get exceptions to work, just to get all this stuff to work that's got absolutely nothing to do with chemistry. Uh, so I had a friend who worked at NASA and was trying to convince me for 10 years to get into LISP. And finally, I started looking at it. I wrote a little LISP interpreter. It took me about two months. I hooked it into my C++ code. I had it running on 40,000 CPUs on uh, Kraken, which was a machine on the NSF Terra grid at the time. It was wonderful. It sang. And I built, designed the molecules that you've seen so far with that. It was great. It wasn't quite fast enough. 
And so I decided, okay, if I'm gonna do lists, I'm just gonna go whole hog. I'm gonna pick the best list imp implementation that there is, and that's Common Lisp. And I'm going to hook my code into Common Lisp. Uh, four years later, uh, I've, I've gone and implemented a new Common Lisp, and it's called Clasp. Okay. I did a couple of things different. There are about a dozen versions of Common Lisp available, but none of them had what I needed, unfortunately. And I'll explain that. Basically what I've done is implemented a new Common Lisp that uses LLVM as the back end. Uh, so you write Common Lisp code, the compilers that I have will generate LLVM IR, and then LLVM lowers that to optimized machine code, and um, it all works. Let me explain to you sort of some of the things that I want to do. In the chemistry software that I use, there's a lot of math. There's a lot of nonlinear optimization. There's a lot of simulation of dynamics of molecules. And I need to be able to describe energy functions, and I need to be able to calculate forces and second derivatives, first and second derivatives of energy functions. I need energy functions that don't exist in a lot of molecular mechanics force fields. So a force field is just an equation. It's a bunch of terms. Like this is a Hooke's law spring. This is what we use to describe bonds, okay? So you, here we've got ethane, and we describe the bond between the two carbon atoms by a Hooke's law spring. We say that there's an optimal bond length, L0, and there's a force constant, and any time the length of that bond is, deviates from the optimal, uh, the energy of the system goes up, okay? So that tends to restore the bond to an optimal length. And we know what those bond lengths are from crystal structures and chemists have been working on this for 100 years. Okay, we've got all that pretty much sorted out. And then we've got terms for bond angles. We've got terms for dihedral angles where bonds are sort of rotating around. Um, so this is a molecular mechanics force field. And all these parameters, we have uh, tables of those that I can draw from to bring them into my code. Now, what that gives us is for a complex molecule like what I'm building is a huge multi-dimensional space that we have to search. And the energy changes very quickly as you change the shape of the molecule. And what we're interested in is one thing is finding where these low, these energy minima are because those are sort of stable shapes that the molecule likes to adopt. And since mine are all ladder molecules and tied together through multiple covalent bonds, they don't have a lot of flexibility to them. Uh, so finding a global energy minimum is something I can achieve with, with uh, the mathematics and the kind of molecules that I've designed. The other thing we want to know is how these molecules move, how to simulate their motions. And so that means basically putting it in one point in space and then letting it shake around. Uh, to do all this stuff, you need derivatives. You need the forces. You need the second derivatives. And these are huge. If you put them into Mathematica, and you say, calculate the derivative of just the Hooke's law equation. Uh, you get these massive expressions that are absolutely useless for doing calculations because you're constantly reevaluating the same stuff over and over again. So what I want is code that would, where I could write an energy function and then have it automatically generate the, do the symbolic differentiation and then automatically lower that to optimal machine code. I've done this. I've built a prototype. It's in Mathematica. You're welcome to use it. Basically, what it does is it takes all this nonsense here and turns it into optimized C code. And it, this is a graphical representation. Here are the inputs, the coordinates, and the force constants. And then what I try to do here is minimum the number, minimize the number of red operations, reciprocal square roots. Those are expensive. So minimize those. Uh, I think blue are products and green are additions. And out on the other side come all the first, second derivatives and the energy. All right. This is the simplest function. If I put anything more complicated, it is just a mass of green and blue. Um, but this stuff runs at about 110% of the speed of hand-optimized C code or Fortran code. Uh, I think I can do even better if I could lower this to LLVMIR. That's what I want to do. I want to be able to put in equations. Maxima is the sort of predecessor of, of Mathematica. I can generate derivatives. I can generate 
common list, I can generate code basically and then generate LLVMIR and generate native code from equations on the fly. That's one thing I'd like to do with, with the capability that I'm developing here. The other thing I want to do is just write programs in common lisp. Common lisp has all these wonderful features that just haven't made it into a lot of other languages. And, and I want to just add a whole bunch of new chemistry packages and functions like load a force field, load a molecule, assign atom types, assign atom charges, There's a lot of pattern recognition that goes on in these processes here, and then run molecular dynamic simulations by calling out to C++ code that will do the actual calculations on uh, using libraries that I don't want to have to write. Um, so, so why choose common list? Well, it's basically Greenspun's rule that any sufficiently complicated C or Fortran program contains an ad hoc, informally specified, bug-written, slow implementation of half of common Lisp. And I was there when I had the Lisp and the C++, uh, the, the Python and the C++ stuff. I was dealing with garbage collection and, uh, you know, path names and, and just all sorts of stuff that I was having to sort of reinvent and it was buggy and nobody else would ever, I'd have to document it. And it just seemed simpler to pick a language that had all these features already and then just use those and hook into other people's common list libraries and be able to use like, you know, regular expression libraries from common list. If I could reuse all this work that other people have done and hook it into C++, it would be fantastic. Um, so I put these in more for archival purposes because a lot of you guys work with, you folks work with common lists. But the, the real thing that I wanted was macros, true macros that are written in the language that I'm implementing. So I can write programs that write programs. Because I've reached a point now where I'm tired of writing for loops. I'm tired of writing the same code over and over again. And I can write, I'm, I'm pretty good at writing macros, it turns out, writing code that generates code, metaprogramming. It's, I just love it. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm there. It has all these other features, dynamic variables, multiple return values. Uh, I can go on and on and on. Uh, this other one's really important, a tunable compiler. I really wanted a compiler that I understood where I could write high-level code and take it all the way down to native code by myself. So if I want to do things like use GPUs uh, to, to solve something that I could hook into the compiler to do that. And Common Lisp would give me this ability. It's a programmable programming language. Okay, what about the C++? How do I tie it in? Okay, so what's missing from every Common Lisp is a way of interfacing to C++. C++ has kind of exploded over the last 20 years. Lots of people are writing libraries in it, and it is hostile to interaction with other languages. Not, not by design or anything, but just to, to add all these higher level language features to it, it keeps growing, and it's just getting harder and harder for other languages to hook into. It's really easy to hook into C. There's very simple ABI there. But C++ has, you know, name mangling, virtual functions, overloading, uh, exception handling, move semantics, and it's, I hook into it, I can tell you, it's tricky. Um, and the, the, the problem here is always the interface between the scripting language and the, and the low-level libraries. Um, getting all this stuff right, the wrapper classes and memory management, exception handling, it's, it's, um, it's very tricky. It very quickly takes over the project. Okay, this interface starts to grow and take over everything. It consumes all your time. So the current state of C++ common Lisp interoperation is foreign function interfaces. You have to basically write a C interface to, uh, for your C++ library, and then common Lisp, almost every common Lisp implementation can hook into that. Um, and that becomes the problem. Okay, so the thing is C++ has this facility in it called template programming. It's an attempt to achieve something like what we have in common list with macros. But C++ template programming is to common list macros what IRS tax forms are to poetry. <laughs> All right? 
because basically you can write this code with slots in it where you can stick in types and a little bit of information and, and stamp out a new chunk of code, but you don't have the expressiveness. It is Turing complete. It's accidentally Turing complete, whatever that means. Uh, but it is awful to write with. You're, you're, what you want to do is spread so wide across all these different repeated blocks of code that it's impossible to understand what another programmer tried to do. But it is powerful enough to build an interface to another language. And it does know everything about the functions, the C++ functions and classes that you want to expose. So we, I could use C++ template programming to do this. And this has been done before. What inspired me was, well, what I really learned about this from was this thing called Boost Python. It's one of the Boost libraries, and it's a C++ template programming library that lets you hook into Python. And basically, all you have to do is give it the name of the function in Python, a pointer to your function in C++, and it builds the wrapper for you at compile time. It's really complex and, and hard to understand. There's another variant of it called Lua Bind for the language Lua. That's the one I actually stole and hacked to create CL Bind, a common Lisp version of it. The model here is to develop something like Scientific Python. So Scientific Python is becoming sort of the de facto high-level scripting language of science. And it's only because of Boost Python that it lets you hook Python into C++ without wrapper C code. It's all done by the compiler. So I implemented a new common list called CLASP. It's 150,000 lines of C++ code. What I did was I took all the common Lisp code from embedded common Lisp, from ECL, which ultimately came from Kyoto common Lisp. I owe these guys a lot. It's wonderful code. Took these 2,600 lines. It's running on top of my new underlying engine, which is written in C++. I took about 10% of the C code in ECL and I translated it into common less, but the rest of it's all written by me. And I own all the bugs, so no all that. Um, I did not use their compiler because I don't understand it. I wrote a new one. I wrote this library called CLBind, which lets you um, expose C++ code to my common Lisp. I first wrote a common Lisp interpreter, exposed, wrote CL bind, then I exposed the LLVM C++ APIs for building modules and finalizing those modules to generate native code. I, I hooked all that stuff in. So then I could start building LLVM modules from common Lisp. Then progress started going really quickly. I, could, I wrote a compiler. I've never written a compiler before. I've only been programming common Lisp for about four years. So I, uh, sorry. So I, I exposed LLVM, and then I also exposed a lot of the Clang AST library, and I'll show you why. So the Clang is the C++ compiler built on LLVM. I hooked that into Clasp as well. It's sort of a side uh, project. Recently, I implemented tag pointers, immediate fixed nums, characters, and single floats so that I can do generate really fast code. That's only about a month old now. Um, I've gotten it all working to the point where I've got ASDF, Slime, and QuickLisp running in CLASP. Uh, it, all it needs to bootstrap is a C++ compiler. So I've got this S expression walking interpreter, which is pretty slow. It loads up a compiler, compiles itself. Then the bootstrapping compiler generates pretty slow, inefficient code, but it does get CLOS running. With CLOS running, what I can do is I can import Robert Strand's Cleaver compiler. Now, Robert Strand is a brilliant computer science professor at the University of Bordeaux. Brilliant, methodical, snappy dresser. He's been writing this new common Lisp implementation called Sickle. And he's really doing it sort of for his research, sort of looking at what people have implemented in common Lisp and trying to do better and doing better. Cleaver is the compiler component. It's not quite finished, but it does do uh, take S expressions and take it to an intermediate representation that I can then convert into LLVM and lower to native code. And I've got that working now. Um, but basically, CLASP looks like ECL. 
It's so similar to embedded common list that in the implementation dependent systems that you get with ASDF, you can make them run with class by just converting all the pound plus ECLs to pound plus clasps. And uh, you know, I've replicated a lot of, of ECL. Um, okay, so I've talked a lot about this. I'll just point out some highlights here. So clasp is to C++ and LLVM what armed bear common lisp and closure are to the Java virtual machine. It sort of, it sort of takes a similar uh, place. It uses LLVM to generate native code. It does both just-in-time and ahead-of-time compilation. And the just-in-time compilation is all done in memory. It doesn't go out to files to do anything. It's using the C++ API straight up. Uh, it's very easy to expose C++ functions. I'll show you an example of that. Let me check the time here. OK, well, I'm good. Uh, I also exposed the Clang, some of the Clang C++ compiler. And um, all of this, what it lets you do is do things like I can profile common Lisp code and C++ code together because they speak the same underlying language. They're all LLVMIR, ultimately. Uh, it generates dwarf debugging information. OK, so, I'm gen so you can use GDB to debug common Lisp programs. And uh, I've hooked in a serialization component so that I can serialize all my chemistry classes that are written in C++. Uh, you can extend class by adding C++ classes that get managed by the garbage collector. So you can basically add sort of classes that become first class citizens in CLASP. And I do that in my chemistry code. And currently, CLASP supports two garbage collectors. The main one is going to be the compacting garbage collector by Ravenbrook called the memory pool system. It's a C library that I've hooked in. And it allows me to take my sort of 350 C++ classes and do compacting, moving garbage collection with them, stuff that people on the plus plus C plus plus or pound pound C++ IRC channel said was impossible. I am moving C++ class around, updating all the pointers in memory. It works. It's like a jet engine. The thing works. Um, I use the Boehm garbage collector to bootstrap the system because you know, I'll, I'll describe this part. OK, so this is a fancy thing that I did. To get the compacting garbage collection to work with class, with C++, what I did is I expose the Clang abstract syntax tree and AST matcher libraries to CLASP, to the common Lisp. So I can read in C++ code and search the abstract syntax tree that's built within common Lisp. I can analyze, do pattern recognition on C++ code. I can even refactor C++ code. I can do, I can generate refactoring. Um, this is something that Google has put a lot of time in. Chandler Carruth's talk he gave a couple of years ago on this, where Google is using this sort of refactoring facility to, you know, improve the APIs in the Googleplex, the, all the C++ code you guys use. I've done that sort of a small version. While you guys have developed the Battleship that works on 100 million lines of code, I've developed a little Volkswagen here that is good for individual product projects. What I've done with this is I've written a static analyzer that tracks down every pointer in every class that needs to be managed by the garbage collector. And it builds, a, it, it's parsing currently 173 C++ source, source files in all the headers. It generates about 20,000 lines of C++ code that interfaces with the memory pool system. It updates and move, allows all these about 300 C++ classes to move and be compacted in memory. And it updates 2,600 global variables. It tracks them all down and updates them all. If one pointer is out of place, the whole thing tears itself apart. It runs. OK, and the really nice thing is you can then extend CLASP and add a whole you know, lots of additional C++ classes that also get garbage collected as first class citizens. You can also hook in libraries that are completely naive and that don't use the garbage collection facility. So there's two ways to sort of embed and extend class. OK, so just quickly, I'll show you how you can expose C++ libraries. I don't use anything like a foreign function interface. This is it. 
If you have a C++ function like this one that takes two doubles, adds them together and returns a double, all you do is you call def, you give it a string, which is the name in common Lisp, you give it a pointer to the function, which is in C++, and it builds the wrapper function at compile time. That's all you'd have to do. And you can do a lot of things. I'm just showing you a really simple example here. Here I've created a class called vec2. It contains x and y coordinate, x and y values. Uh, here's the constructor, set x and y. Calculate a dot product, you pass it another vector. It calculates the dot product, returns a double. And then I wrote a function here that just prints uh, a string and the vector. And then here, I expose it. So you declare a new package, common list package called vec. Uh, you expose the vector class and the constructor here, make vec2. So it'll call this constructor that takes two doubles and returns a vector. I expose the dot product function. I expose the print vector function. Then you build that library. You load it as a dynamic library. In Linux, it's a .so file. Then you can make vectors, and then you can do operations on them. Okay, and the memory management, everything's dealt with. You can take possession of pointers or not take possession of pointers by setting it up in the interface. But basically, you can hook in C++ library. This is a simple example. I have hooked in the Clang library, huge, complex library that doesn't know anything about interfacing with any other languages, works great. And I was able to write the static analyzer with that. So where am I going with this? The next thing is to make it fast. Currently, the code it generates is about 100 times slower than Steelbank Common Lisp. That's because I'm doing everything in the safest, stupidest way. I'm calling out to C++ functions for everything. I add one to x. I've got to promote them all to big nums, do the addition. If they fit, I'll take them back down to fixed nums. Terrible. I know how to fix that. So basically, using Cleaver, I can make this fast. I can, use, I can generate a lot more LLVMIR. Cleaver lets me do aggressive inlining of uh, functions. Cleaver also does type inference, and it'll basically eliminate all the type checks and the code that's not necessary based on you know, the type information that it infers from the code or that you provide it with declares. Uh, there's just a little taste of Cleaver. My bootstrapping compiler just takes S expressions straight to LLVMIR. There's no room to do optimizations in there. Cleaver has a bunch of additional layers where it'll take S expressions, generate an abstract syntax tree, and it generates these really nice little graphs using graphviz. Uh, and then it'll take the abstract syntax tree and turn it into an intermediate representation where the rectangles are all instructions and the solid arrows show the flow of control. And then the dotted arrows are the flow of data. And these ellipses here are variables. Right now, there's no determination whether the variables belong on the heap or the stack. It does escape analysis and it figures out all these hexagons can go on the stack. If something needs to go on the heap, it builds a, a closure for it and builds that into the code. Uh, and then my code will, I reuse all of the bootstrapping compiler to generate LLVM IR from that. And then LLVM takes it the rest of the way. Okay, so I wanted to build molecules. I am so deep down the rabbit hole now. <laughs> There's only one way out, and that is forward to make this thing fast. Hook it in. I've already hooked in my chemistry code in the last month. I got it all back running again. Three years that stuff sat. Now I've hooked it all back in. I have can do running, so I can build small molecules with it. The ultimate goal is to build molecular machines. All right, I've done a little side project here that I hope to tie into my research. I hope other people can use it as well, because maybe then I'll get help working on it. Um, but the idea is to design software that will let me design molecules, assemble these kind of uh, molecular Lego, this instruction set for matter for building molecules that can speed up chemical reaction, act as new drug, uh, drugs, uh, you know, act as channels. It's available on the internet, uh, github.com, drmeister, clasp. Uh, 
there, if you want to work on the front end, the bleeding edge of development, the branches are all up there. And uh, it runs right now on Mac and Linux, all, lots of distributions. And uh, oh, I didn't mention, uh, there's a, a chat room on Freenode called Pound Clasp, where a bunch of us hang out and uh, talk about Clasp and Common Lisp. I'm also very active in the Lisp uh, chat room on Freenode. Um, so with that, uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Right on time. Yes, and if you could come forward, I was asked to point people at the microphone there. So in the end, what's better about this than Python? You said that Python was very painful because you had to use Boost Python, and you ended up implementing something that is almost the same as Boost Python, except for a different language. Yes. Um, so Python is slow. Will it, I will be faster than Python once I'm done. Python doesn't have macros. Python doesn't have all the other nice features of common lists that I've I now want. Um, it's a little hard to describe because I've, it was kind of like two years of pain, and then I finally decided to stop and try something else. So uh, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. I think Python is a wonderful language. My students, that's how they learn programming, or my one student who decided to learn some programming, learned it with Python. It's a wonderful language, I think, for, it's pretty, it's nice to read, but uh, I just find it, when I, when I need to do big, hard things, it, it's, for me, it's very limiting. So. I noticed that you said that you, that your system generates dwarf debugging output. Yes. And you like macros. Yes. Have you ever actually tried to use a dwarf-based debugger with stuff that has macros in it? That's a that's that's a problem to solve tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, I I still don't know quite how we're going to deal with that. Um, but it, it it's uh, it's not working perfect. It's not working perfectly, and Cleaver doesn't have support generating dwarf yet. Uh, the code's all in there. I just haven't hooked it in yet. Um, but I. My stack traces are common Lisp, C++, common Lisp, C++. They're interleaved. And occasionally, I will crawl up the stack trace, and I will see common Lisp code in LLDB. And I don't know. I know I set it up to do that. But sometimes it works, and sometimes it doesn't work. And it is wonderful. Um, I've, I've got to tie it in better, but it, it's, it's really nice. To, to, Dwarf is really nice. Uh, macros are, you know, and there aren't a lot of language. There aren't a lot of languages that have macros like Common Lisp does. It's uh, it's going to be an interesting problem to try and solve there. Yeah. Yes. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about the sort of chemistry algorithmic point of view of trying to solve the combinatorial optimization problem of. I want a catalyst that does this. Yes. I've, you know, as soon as I have a non-trivial number of these pieces together, I just have to write out, you know, too many possibilities. You know, even if the force dynamics are, is very, very fast, I still have to search a huge space and excellent I'll, I'll question. And I forgot to. Well, um, yeah. So basically, Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo solves every problem. Um, <laughs> What I know for like a catalyst development, so I, 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 all the catalysts that I showed you, and there's, there's a couple, we've, we've made three catalysts that we've published so far. We're collaborating, this is Department of Defense funded work, funded by the Defense Threat Reduction Agency. They're interested in, their mission is to protect the country from chemical, radiological, and biological threats. And one of the things they're interested in are catalysts, in particular, that can hydrolyze nerve agents. Nerve agents are very nasty molecules that kill us in very, very small quantities. And they're pretty reactive. And if you could just speed up the reaction where they react with water, you could turn them into stuff that's in Coca-Cola, phosphoric acid. 
And, uh, but you need the right shape of molecule to do that. Now, nerve agents have only been on the planet for about 100 years. But the bacteria that are in cornfields have started to develop resistance to nerve agents because we use weak nerve agents as pesticides. And so they've been coming up with these molecules, these organophosphate hydrolase molecules that I showed you. And we know what the insides of those enzymes look like. We know that they hold two zinc atoms in a precise constellation with a couple of other groups around it. And there's a pocket where the, nerve, where the pesticide can go in. And it activates water and cleaves the right bond. And then the stuff is detoxified. We know where those groups are. Nature has already given us the plan. OK, so the problem is those organophosphate enzymes, they don't work with the nerve agents that kill us. They react with. Uh, so what we can do is on the computer is we can sort of rearrange the groups so that we could react with nerve agents. We know where the groups are in space. All I need to do is find a scaffolding behind them that will hold them in place and one that I can synthesize. Since our synthesis is all modular, that problem's kind of solved. But the design, so what do you do? Well, you, you Take a computer model that shows where the four, five, six, seven groups are in space, and then you try and build a scaffold behind it that can hold those groups in place, projecting off of the points on the building blocks so that we can functionalize. The goal there is then, to, you'll, what you'll get is a molecule that's a few percent the size of this enzyme, but it's indestructible. The problem with those enzymes is you make a gallon of it and you dump it on a tank to try and detoxify the tank. Um, the protein will just unfold. They unfold when you look at them the wrong way. They're very fragile molecules. The things that we could build would be indestructible, small. You could store them on a shelf for 100 years and they would still work. And they will work for a long time. They won't just work for a few minutes and then unfold. Okay, so you're, that's basically the idea. Hold, come up with a, okay, the algorithm is basically come up with a scaffold with the groups presented on it. Do a root mean square calculation for how far the groups are from your model to where they need to be. Randomly mutate the backbone. Score them again. If it's improved, keep going. If it's gotten worse, roll a dice based on a temperature factor, decide to keep it or go back, and then just repeat that. It's an embarrassingly parallelizable problem. You can run this on th hundreds of thousands of CPUs in parallel, starting from s different starting configurations and look for local optima. And the idea is that there's not just one solution to the problem, there's a million solutions out of the trillion that I could make, and I just need to find some locally optimal solutions. Then we'll go make them and see if they work. And if we get any kind of activity, then we can make variants around that, you know, real molecules, and then screen those for even higher active ones. But fundamentally, it's Monte Carlo. Yes. Hi. So you might have just kind of answered this, and also this might be premature, but so what would actually programming, like designing in this look like? Like let's say you were trying to make something similar to uh, you know, that, that little like walking protein that, that pulls a ribosome down DNA. Um, like do you have Tricky, any sense of yep. what that feels like when you're actually writing it? So um, these first ones are more just about getting four, five, six groups in the right place in space. Yeah. Doing something like a motor, yeah. that means designing a catalyst that will hydrolyze a fuel molecule and transducing that chemical reaction into a molecular mechanical motion across a hinge. Mm -hmm. Haven't figured all that stuff out yet. I need to be able to build a lot of these things and start messing around in that space to develop that kind of capability. But it absolutely can be developed because we our biology does it. And, and we just need to build our own versions of it. Yeah, but, but that kind of a molecular motor, there are people who are making molecular motors, they're very clever. I, I want to build it in this kind of substrate where I can attach other functionality to it. So you could have grippers that could grab things and then move at the same time. Yes. Um, so you said a few times that these are essentially indestructible. And that just brings one question to mind. Clean up. <laughs> right. Um, so you can burn them. 
they're, they're, uh, they're basically made out of the same kind of atoms and groups that peptides and proteins are. I don't think they're inherently going to be toxic. But um, the best thing to do is fish them back, fish them back out of the environment and, br and build catalysts that would break them back down again. <laughs> That's what we would have to do. Because there are no natural cat enzymes that break them down. And this, this is a problem right now in society, right? We're building all these plastics that nature doesn't know how to break down. And there's a fascinating story I could tell you about later about, about just trees, you know, trees, lignin, <coughs> first biological plastic. For 100 million years, that stuff was building up in the environment, eventually it became coal until an organism, fungus, figured out how to break it down again. And then the Carboniferous period ended. Um, that's an example of where nature made something that accumulated in the environment until something figured out how to break it down. For these things, at first there aren't going to be a lot of them, but as they, if they do start to build up, we'll have to build catalysts to break them back down again. Okay. Oh. Uh, so I make common list compilers that generate uh, hardware, computing hardware for FPGA. So in instead oh. of generating um, instructions, mm -hmm. we run on a computer or processor. I'm generating gates, basically. Yeah. And, uh, and that's used for um, embarrassingly parallel Monte Carlo kind of stuff. So have you looked at that kind of things? And do you think that the computation you, uh, you, are, you, you need for this uh, uh, optimization would fit in uh, in in I, specialized other way. I think we're trying. To, we're solving very similar problems using very similar approaches. I mean, that that sounds great. I'd like to talk to you about okay. about that. Yeah. Okay. But so you do use Monte Carlo to do this? No, I, I generate Monte Carlo machines. In fact, okay, which are pure hardware, so they are gates. So if you need to do. A, uh, 1,000 multiplies, for instance. Yeah. You, you will do them with 1,000 multipliers. So in one clock, you will uh, you will do. Uh, and uh, it has been used for finance Monte Carlo simulation. And uh, yep. basically, it's 1,000 times faster than a CPU. Yeah, and you're doing this in common list. Yeah, the common list generates all the, the, the gates and the, the connections to the gates and all that. Yep, yep. I, I'd love to talk to you more about that. Okay. Well, thanks so much. And, Thank you. Um, <laughs>